So it's this idea of like, is a journalist just like a megaphone? You know, legacy media outlets by and large were all on board with a certain narrative. People needed a place like Twitter where they could be exposed to different ideas. Were some of those ideas completely nuts? Yes, but many of those ideas were absolutely legitimate. This is a place for legitimate debate by people who understand the issues. Those views were suppressed in many instances. That is very troubling. There was a, a Trump tweet about how he said something like, don't be afraid anymore of COVID. It was something to that effect. Does this go against our, our guidelines? Shouldn't we be like, you know, labeling this as, as misleading or take it down? And <laughs> some of the other executives had to write back and say, um, optimism is not against our policy. <laughs> <laughs> My God, this like super high right. level person actually even entertained the idea for something like that to be suppressed. That alone was, was like kind of astonishing. It was just a bizarre experience that I will never get over. Like it's permanently altered me. April. Our brilliant guest today is an author and journalist, David Zweig. Welcome to Trigonometry. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure. Before we get cracking, uh, tell everybody who are you, how are you, where you are, what has been the journey through life that leads you to be sitting here talking to us? <laughs> it all began on the subway. <laughs> or that was the last leg of the journey. Yeah. Um, I'm a writer. I write books. I write uh, news articles, investigative pieces, commentary. Um, so I've been doing that for a number of years. Um, written a few books. Before that, I uh, was playing music for a number of years. Uh, the joke I like to tell people is, um, well, it wasn't a joke, this was real, that <clears throat> after I'd been trying to succeed as a musician for many years, um, I went home and I said, mom, dad, you know, and this is very hard on them having a kid who's you know, trying to do that. And I said, look, I'm no longer trying to make it as a rock star, don't worry. And they said, oh, thank God. And I said, instead, I'm going to be writing a novel. No! <laughs> it's like the worst. So I, I choose uh, uh, uneasy paths, I guess. But finally, it seems to have uh, been working out. Uh, so I've kind of hit my stride, I think, in the last decade, mm -hmm. um, working in nonfiction and doing what I'm doing. And here I am, I guess, chatting with you guys. Yeah, and one of the things we really wanted to talk to you about is, is the Twitter files. Mm -hmm. And to... See, I still don't know what I think about it because on the one hand, I was one of the people who was like super excited about uh, seeing, you know, lifting the curtain, so to speak. But I also felt that when we did, we kind of only really saw what we already knew and so it was kind of pre-discounted. Now, I'm not saying that's accurate, but that was my impression. Mm. So what is it about the Twitter files that people should actually think, oh, that, that was worthwhile, you know, all this hype and, and all the rest of it? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I can only speak about my own reporting, yeah. or at least I, I can only speak. I well, only tell us about the experience it. first of all. What yeah. was it like going in there, and you know, get, um, how, how did it work? Yeah, so I, um, I was brought out there by Barry Weiss, mm -hmm. who, um, as most people probably know, Elon Musk gave access to Matt Taibbi initially. I think he was the first one, and then some short period of time after that. He gave Barry access. Barry runs basically a media empire. <laughs> yes, she does. So I'm just a small piece of the empire, I guess. And um, and I had sent an email to Barry and and one or two of her editors who I knew because um, I had written for them before. And I said, because I've been writing about COVID stuff for since the beginning of the pandemic, I, I didn't know what they were doing if they were going back. I didn't know anything. I just said, just trying to be helpful. Look, if you guys are going to um, be sending someone else back there, whatever, or if you're going back yourself, these are the things I might look for. And I was kind of sheepish, actually. Like, I thought it was a little maybe presumptuous of me to, I'm like, who am I to tell them? But I was just, uh, these are a few things I would do, 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 do. And like an hour later, I get an email back, can you get on a plane to San Francisco? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, okay. So they, you know, they figured, you know, I guess based on that and everything that they know about me, that I should be the one to go out and at least initially look into um, stuff related to COVID. Because I think up to that point, the reporting wasn't specific to the pandemic. It was on a variety of other mm -hmm. things, Hunter Biden, laptop and other stuff. So I went out there really the sort of, um, I don't know if this is the right word, but the specialist. I'm like, this is the one lane that I'm mm -hmm. going to travel in, which is related to COVID. Um, and so I was there, it was only a few days while I was there, Michael Schellenberger was there, Leighton Woodhouse, Lee Fong. Um, so it was um, the three of them and me, and um, each of us working on our own things, but everyone was helping each other as well, um, just because it was so challenging 
to look through the material. And, um, and that's it. I basically, I mean, I could get into a little bit of details about what the process, <laughs> you're nodding yeah. like, yes, please do. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because I think, there, I, I think there's still a fair amount of misunderstanding or confusion about what the process was. People are like, why didn't you do this? Or you should have done that. I think what a lot of people don't know or realize is it's not like going into some, I don't know, company or some law firm where they're like, open up the books and you can, you know, just rifle through. There are very specific ways that we were able to search. There were no restrictions on what we could look up or or publish. Um, That's important to, to note. But the process of actually searching was really challenging. This is not like what we're used to as regular citizens, like Googling something or whatever. The, the, the systems in place to actually do the digging were, um, were not very user friendly. So I would break it down into there's basically two separate paths that we could search down. One was looking at what I would call like the log files of individual accounts. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was an engineer in the room with us on a special laptop, and we could give him someone's name and say, I would like to look up this person's account. We were not able to see any like private information on anyone's account, which is important for me to note because there were tons of lawyers involved in this. Um, But what we were able to see were on someone's account, their activity and what Twitter internally had, if there were any flags or marks on certain things on the account as a whole or on certain tweets. And then there were tons of kind of files within files. Within files. Um, so that was one thing to search. And then the other one was looking up um, internal communications or internal and external um, through email or through Slack channels. Mm-hmm. And so the way that those searches were not performed in the room. We had to basically send them an email to the people. I don't know if they were like next door to us or what, but they were. it wasn't directly in there. And then sometime later, a person would come in with a different laptop and say, here's this stuff, you can look at this now. So if you imagine, we're looking at, and we had to look up specific employees. You couldn't just say, I wanna find anything on myocarditis. No, you had to give, and I'm not sure the reasoning behind this, but you had to pick certain employees and they could look up that employee's emails. And we could say, I wanna see all the emails from this person from this date to this date. Um, and then, so we, we could get, 4,000 emails from someone. If you're looking, so, and I have, you know, X number of hours and one to, to look at this stuff. So it's, it's, it's very challenging. It's more, it's not just like, oh, let's just do a word search and we're done. Um, although that was part of it. So you're trying to sift through all this stuff to find what you're looking for. Sometimes I had a specific idea. Most of the time I knew what I was looking for and it was just seeing if it was there or not there. And other times you don't even know what you're looking for. It's just like, I know this is an important person. I know this particular topic is something that we might have reason to believe something happened. Let's see what's there, if something's interesting or not interesting or newsworthy or not newsworthy. And that was so, it was very laborious, very tedious to do these types of searches. The stuff on the log files, I mean, it could take a very long time to like dig through and you find a particular tweet. And then, and then through there, there's all sorts of code and different stuff written there. And then the engineer was basically explaining to me, okay, here we go. I can see this tweet, what's labeled on here um, or not labeled. Does that make sense how I'm describing yeah, it? Yeah, does. Okay. It, very much so. <laughs> okay. And I was going to ask, so... What role did Elon have in this? Was he overseeing it? Did you have to report to him? Did you have to say, look, this is what we found? Right. Did, how involved was he in this entire investigation? I love the way you call him Elon, by the yeah. way. He's, <laughs> your, he's your best mate. No, well, he, look, I'm being professional. Between me and him, it's musky. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, again, at least from my, my experience, um, I had no personal interaction with, with Musk at all. Um, my understanding is, and this was through talking with Barry, was that um, he we had un, we had access to whatever we wanted. There were no restrictions, and um, the only uh, sort of rule was whatever we found, we had to publish it on Twitter first. Mm-hmm. And you know, and it didn't need to be far in advance, but it could be five minutes. But it just needed to go on to Twitter first. Mm-hmm. Other than that, it wasn't. If you find X, Y, or Z, you're not allowed to do this, et cetera. And As far as I'm aware, unless there was some incredible conspiracy happening, um, there was similarly, there was no um, constraints placed on us to get the information. So both in regards to what we were able to look for and then what we found, neither of those had any restrictions on them whatsoever. You know, this engineer is, I'm literally looking over the person's shoulder as they're doing the searches. I cannot 
imagine how that could have been in some way compromised without us knowing. It's some other guy had interviewed me and he kept saying, well, maybe the email searches or the other thing, they were filtering it. And again, we're talking about thousands of emails. I, I can't imagine how they could possibly have done this. And it took us, a team of four people in real time looking, so I don't, see, because they didn't know what we were gonna be searching for. Mm -hmm. So this all was happening in real time. It was very kind of like by the seat of your pants, just trying to do it. I saw Elon while we were there, um, but there was no, he did not interact with me or have any involvement um, as far as what I was looking for and what I was able to publish. And that being the case, what do, with your findings, what was the thing that shocked you the most? What was the thing that surprised you? Hmm. I would, I think looking at some of the prior reporting, um, I think maybe I had a little bit more of, a, of an assumption about the staff, you know, this guy Joel Roth and some mm. other people. And I have to say, um, many, many instances, as I'm reading through these internal Slack communications and in emails, in many instances, these people at Twitter really were trying their best mm -hmm. to moderate content in a way that they thought was reasonable. Now, I think they were wrong in how they performed this, but I, but there's that, you know, there's, this is kind of a harsh expression, it's a, but you know, what's the thing about don't ascribe to, to, you know, nefariousness, what can be, you know, actually is just sort of stupidity. Or I'm not saying that they were stupid, but in the sense that I don't think this was some big plot that, 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 that these people genuinely were trying to sift out things that they believed were harmful. I think they were completely out of their depth with what they were doing. And I think structurally, this was totally inappropriate about how they handled a whole variety of things. If, so versus like on an individual level, I saw a lot of people with a lot of conversations pushing back against what they perceived the government wanted, pushing back against what other coworkers wanted. In too many instances, bad choices were made, but it is not like there was this thing constantly all the time where they were just you know, taking out the red pen against all sorts of tweets that they didn't like. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, an internal debate that happened oftentimes, and I reported on, on a few of them. One of them that was actually kind of both encouraging in the end result, but also revealing in the same way about how problematic it was, um, Jim, I, think, I forget the guy's name, but one of the, the lead attorneys at Twitter, there was a, a Trump tweet about how he said something like, don't be afraid anymore of COVID. It was something to that effect. Mm. And he was emailing people internally saying, does this go against our, our guidelines? Shouldn't we be like, you know, labeling this as, as misleading or take it down? And <laughs> some of the other executives had to write back and say, um, optimism is not against our policy. <laughs> so it was both like good that yeah. there was that stopgap, but also like, my God, this like super high right. level person actually even entertained the idea for something like that to be suppressed. That alone was, was like kind of astonishing. Well, that is astonishing. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I mean, I think if you remember, and most people want to forget that period of time because it, you know, it, it was a bit, uh, not a bit, it was very unpleasant for a lot of people and for a lot of people traumatic. But one of the things I think a lot of people, particularly those of us who felt that both government and big tech became quite authoritarian during the pandemic, was this feeling that we're not actually able to have a proper sensible discussion about something that actually really matters. To what extent do you feel based on what you saw, our ability to genuinely discuss one of the most important issues in our lifetimes, actually, for a lot of people, was curtailed by what they ended up doing at Twitter, whether it was maliciously motivated or whether it was incompetence or stupidity or they just thought that's the right way to do it. How, how much of what happened was wrong, I guess is what I'm asking you. Um, it's impossible to quantify because I, I didn't do some sort of systematic, yeah. you know, analysis. Um, but I would characterize it to, to my mind, it was profoundly wrong about what happened, at least in the things that I researched related and to COVID. Give us a breakdown. Like what are those yeah. things okay. that, that so, were profoundly wrong? Right. So the thing about Twitter is I think a lot of us had hoped or saw it, social media in general as an alternative to sort of, I guess, what's called the mainstream media, legacy media. This is another, this is a, a venue for people who are shut out of these other um, platforms that they can 
use their voice. And, by, and when I say people, it doesn't just mean regular people. I'm talking about highly credentialed experts who just had views that were you know, oppositional to what the establishment wanted. Um, and so what I observed throughout the pandemic and then what I was able to basically prove um, was there was, a, there was a systematic suppression of content that went against the establishment narrative, at least in America, about what was considered appropriate and what was considered correct. Um, and anything oftentimes that went against that was labeled as misleading, um, tweets were taken down, and accounts were suspended um, on numerous occasions. So what I don't know is the extent of that, because again, that would require some sort of analysis that an that, you know, individual reporter is not capable of doing. But what I, we do know is I observed it as a person deep in this for years. And what, and what I wanted to do was kind of deconstruct, um, well, how did this happen? I, you know, because so many times I would see a tweet by someone like Martin Koldorf, who's this prominent um, um, infectious disease epidemiologist who, who was at Harvard Medical School, and I would see stuff by him being labeled as misleading. I'm like, that's troubling. Mm -hmm. What's going on? So, man, when I got to go to Twitter, I'm like, I can try to find out, well, how did that happen? What led to that? So I sort of wanted to work backwards to find out because I was baffled. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Mm -hmm. So there What were, did you find? So what I found, I, I view it as sort of like three different like buckets about how they do this. There, there, were, there was a system of bots that they set up, this sort of like AI system where I, I, I guess they crawl through Twitter and they're trained, whether it's through certain keywords or other mechanisms, they're trained to look for certain tweets that were problematic, that the system, the algorithm viewed as problematic. So some of the tweets that were perfectly legitimate, perfectly appropriate, were caught up in this, this bot system. Um, if you think of like a, a, a trawling net in the ocean, you're looking for a certain type of fish, but inevitably you're, you're going to catch some dolphins in there. Mm -hmm. And I think this bot system probably did catch a lot of garbage, you know, some crazy, you know, conspiratorial QAnon, you know, microchip type of stuff. But in that process, they caught a hell of a lot of dolphins in that net too. Um, so one thing were these bots. The other thing, you had these independent contractors in places like the Philippines who were basically deciding the content, whether something is misleading or not. <laughs> they were given these decision trees, basically, this kind of thing where you would have a drop-down menu. Maybe you see a tweet that has myocarditis in it. Maybe a bot would first flag the tweet. Then it gets sent to this independent contractor, and they're like, myocarditis, click. Then there's a drop-down menu. Good or bad, click. And then, you know, and it, it, there would be this system set up. But the idea that some random guy sitting in a cube farm in the Philippines is going to adjudicate something as complex as whether or not a tweet about myocarditis is misleading or not is insane. Like, of course, they're not going to be able to do that. So you had that. And then the third mechanism were people themselves at Twitter. And there are many instances where either um, a particular tweet or account would be escalated where people were looking at it, or sometimes they were just intervening, like that example about the Trump tweet. So you had real people doing this in, in Twitter you know, at high levels. Um, you had these independent contractors, and then you had this algorithm. So between those three systems, that's how things were flagged. And, what, and you know, we had tweets by people who were physicians, who were you know, licensed medical doctors, who were tweeting things from studies that were published in peer-reviewed journals. Now, does it mean the study is, is well done? I don't know, but it's in a peer-reviewed journal. Certainly not for Twitter to decide that something that's published is not, and nevertheless, they were flagged. And, and, Every instance, these were things that only went in one direction. There never seemed to be something that was too pro-lockdown, pro-vaccine. That would never be flagged, as far as I saw. But anything that questioned that, that is met by, by you know, pulled up in the net. Um, and so there were many instances where things that were true or that were legitimate from published sources that were uh, tweeted by um, credentialed people that were nevertheless flagged. And that to me is just like so profoundly disturbing when you think about the information environment and like what we perceive to be real or not real, what information we're all getting. And for someone like me, who I was knowledgeable about this stuff, it was frustrating and enraging, 
But what I'm more worried about are you know, regular people who have normal jobs, they're not following this stuff closely, and they see misleading tweet, you know, like a label put on it. I mean, that's obviously going to have a, an incredible amount of influence over the, the public conversation and the narrative. Hey, KK, do you believe in spring cleaning? Yes, but only when my wife does it. In Russia, men who clean are executed for not being real men, which is correct. Well, for those men who are living in the 21st century, Manscaped has an incredible offer for you. Manscaped are the global leaders in men's below-the-waist grooming and have forever changed the grooming game with their amazing performance package 4.0. Inside this care bundle, you'll find their lawnmower 4.0. Trimmer, weed whacker, ear and nose hair trimmer, crop preserver, ball deodorant, crop <laughs> reviver toner, performance boxer brief, and a travel bag to hold your goodies. This elite trimmer is designed to trim hair on loose skin. Although your wearables might look like a couple of Boris Johnsons, treat them with respect and benefit from their proprietary skin safe technology. Complete your grooming game this spring with the new refined cologne signature scent by Manscaped. This stuff is legit and will have you smelling like royalty. The good kind, not Prince Andrew. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code TRIGGER20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code TRIGGER20 at manscaped.com. It's time to throw out all your old hygiene habits and upgrade your life. Isn't the real problem here? I mean, to me, there's two real problems, and I'll come to that the second question in a moment. Mm -hmm. But to me, this is the problem when you politicize issues which have no basis in politics whatsoever. This is a virus released from a Chinese laboratory. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> but this little asterisk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this censored, <laughs> censored, uh, channel deleted. But. <laughs> The, isn't the problem when we politicize issues like this? And this is what happens. Well, yeah, it, it's politicized and it's also at least related you know, to COVID specifically. There was this default that the C, whatever the CDC says, mm. we're gonna go with them. And on one level, I appreciate that. I, I get it. It's like, well, am I gonna believe some random you know, doctor or some random, not even doctor, some random person, or am I gonna trust the CDC? So on one level, I get that, but that's not how free speech works. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the experts are wrong all the fucking time. Right. And the, the CDC, or, nor a government, remember the leader of uh, New Zealand? Yeah. I think at one point she said, I am the truth. Maybe she didn't say that, but like the government, we I, are your one source. I will source. be a single source of truth. Yeah. Remember that unless you hear it from us, um, it is not the truth. Dismiss anything else. We will continue to be your single source of truth. We will provide information frequently. That is insane. Mm -hmm. That's horrible for any democracy, for anyone. So I think, you know, it's like, you know, these are cliches, but sunlight is the best disinfectant. Like, let the best ideas win out. Sometimes there will be bad ideas. But what I think this showed was that our government has no confidence in regular people being able to be informed. There is this like incredible sort of like paternalistic attitude of like the masses are stupid and they cannot be trusted. So what I think ultimately happened was this idea of the noble lie, where over and over there would be these uh, infectious disease experts and others within the government where they were saying something, whether it was about vaccines, whether it's about masks, where they were kind of often just gilding the lily. There may have been the underlying truth, but then they would push it over the edge because they felt like they had to encourage people to quote, do the right thing. Mm. And so, and I think Twitter, most of the people who work there, I don't know now after the exodus when Elon took over, but they were almost all of them were, were left leaning. Um, and they were, you know, aligning themselves with the Biden administration, which was aligned with the CDC. So there was this structural, you know, um, bias toward a, a certain truth. But again, I mean, there were plenty of differences of opinion from experts around the world on a lot of these ideas and where co different countries were doing things differently and within America. The idea that you're not supposed to listen to um, the opinion of, of uh, doctor at Harvard Medical School, or someone at Stanford, or anyone for that matter, you have, I don't think 
for obviously anyone should be able to say whatever they want in a country that values free speech. But as far as a, a platform like Twitter, I, I don't think there should be zero constraint because I think it will create an environment where there's just tons of like violence and pornography and stuff that most people probably don't want to be bombarded with that constantly. So it's not that there's no line, but I think the line should be far, far over toward leniency toward like a wide latitude. Um, and they were far, far too tight mm -hmm. on how they were um, controlling and policing information. And it's, it's profoundly wrong that they did that. And it, as I said, you know, it just, it, it, it altered the information environment. And because, you know, legacy media outlets by and large were all on board with a certain narrative, mm -hmm. um, it was, People needed a place like Twitter where they could be exposed to different ideas. Were some of those ideas completely nuts? Yes, but many of those ideas were absolutely legitimate. This is a place for legitimate debate by people who understand the issues, and nevertheless, those views were suppressed in many instances. Mm. That is very troubling. David, oh, sorry, Francis. Yeah, I was gonna say, I have actually, a great deal of empathy for big tech. And I can already see the comments, how can you say it? <laughs> but it's true, because just imagine- You're a cuck, mate. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, <laughs> in the words of my ex-girlfriend. Now, um, <laughs> but just put yourself in their shoes. Mm -hmm. So you've got this pandemic. No one knows what the mortality rate is. We're seeing these images come from places like Italy, where they look absolutely horrific. And then you have this incredibly powerful tool at your fingertips, which I think it's fair to say, no one understands how powerful this thing is, all the long-term implications of this technology. And you have to figure it out as you go along through the pandemic. Isn't it natural that you would err towards the side of caution when dealing with this particular matter? Because I would certainly do that. Yeah, I mean, I think as you know, as I started out saying, I, I I felt a lot of sympathy toward what these people were doing, and and I think they were trying their best. I think you know, one of the things about society and institutions is that ideally structures are put in place to help protect us from ourselves. Your instinct mm -hmm. sounds like a reasonable and natural mm -hmm. one. Let's try to be cautious with like, let's try to, okay, the CDC says X, Y, or Z. Let's stick with that. If someone's saying ABC, different from X, then maybe we should, you know, I, I, the instinct is there and it comes from a good place, I think, in some people, but there needs to be a structure in place to go against that instinct because that instinct is wrong oftentimes. And, you know, there's just so many instances in society for you know, all of history where the experts think one thing and they were wrong. Right. And if anything, something like a pandemic, it, 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 we went in the opposite direction of where we should have gone. We should have, the public, I really, and, and I'm writing a book about the pandemic, specifically about American schools mm -hmm. and what happened with them during the pandemic, but because that's part of the larger thing, I spend a lot of time um, looking at it in sort of like a more panoramic view. and. To me, everything comes back to the public health authorities and that they created an environment where so a place like Twitter um, felt like they had to go with them because they spoke with an unearned certainty about so many things. And as we saw over and over again, those things got walked back from the masking guidance flip-flop to vaccines. We were told they would do one thing and then they did something else. And the excuse of, well, the science changed Sometimes that was true and sometimes it wasn't. But the point isn't that you, you can't change your advice or guidance. The point was that when they initially gave the guidance, when they initially told people about these things, this was said with a strong degree of certainty. Yes. And it was, not only was it politicized, but it was moralized. How you guys doing with vaccine? Oh, I'm not having any yet. I'm waiting for them to be able to. Oh, you should get it first. Uh, okay, that way you won't give it to them. Oh, I thought I thought I would give it to them if I get it. Get no, it. no, not at all. In oh. fact, we got to get you vaccinated so that if you were to get infected, you could pass it on to them. Oh. So you're actually protecting your family by getting them vaccinated. Well, I heard that it doesn't um, cure it and it doesn't 
um, stop you from getting it. No. And so on the very, very, very rare chance that you do get it, even if you're vaccinated, it's a very, you don't even feel sick. It's like you don't even know you got infected. It's very, very good at protecting you. Oh my God. They're gonna keep the a a outbreak smoldering in the country. It's so crazy. I mean, okay. they're not doing it because they say they don't want to do it. They're Republicans. They don't like to be told what to do. And we got to break that, you know, unpack that. I'm not going to be lining up taking a shot on a vaccination for something that wasn't clear in the first place. And then you all create a shot in miraculous time. Nine months is definitely not no. enough for nobody to be taking no vaccination that yeah. you all came up with. The only yeah. reason I'm talking to you right now, well, as close as we are, is that I've been vaccinated. Right. But if it allow thousands of people like you don't get vaccinated, you're going to let this virus continue to percolate in this country and in this world. Something like the common flu then, right? You going to pass. Yeah, definitely. Because right. when, when you start talking about paying people to get vaccinated, when you start talking about incentivizing things to get people vaccinated, there's something else going on with that. Something, yeah, else, something it, else going I, on. It with is that. something going yeah. on. With something it. else. You're right. But I'm glad millions of people like me and almost everybody here didn't get an incentive. You know what their incentive was? Protecting their health and protecting the city. Well, but that, I, well, I won't keep okay, doing it's anymore. It's okay. Our campaign is about fear. It's about inciting fear in people. You all attack people with fear. That's what this pandemic is. It's a fear. It's fear, this pandemic. It was moralized that you were a piece of shit mm. if you did not do what they said. If you didn't wear a mask, you were a right-wing asshole. And, well, the evidence on that has been pretty iffy for a long time about mask mandates. The evidence on a whole variety of things, on school closures and all these other things, mm -hmm. are actually not clear in the slightest bit. I'm spending, you know, a thousand-page book showing that it wasn't the way they said. Look so that, to me, reading. it comes back to that. Well, yes, I, but I guess, the reason we're asking you this question, David, is I think we're all in a position where we're trying to understand what the true impact of this new social media technology is on the world. And one of the things that it has done, it has shattered our shared consensus of reality completely. And the other thing is it puts into question, you know, the two of us, and I'm sure you as well, really feel that free speech is a crucial part of what not only is, you know, you could say the First Amendment in America, but it's not about that. It's about the fact that the entire Western project is based on the principle that people are allowed to express themselves. And at the same time, I have to recognize, you know, we run a YouTube channel which has, you know, half a million subscribers on YouTube and probably the same on the podcast. If we thought that, you know, the comments on our YouTube videos had the potential to kill 10,000 people, <laughs> we would think about right. what we do right. differently. Right. right? Even if our impression of that was wrong. And I think we're all in the place now where the pandemic was really the first major test case yeah. of what we now think we're supposed to do about the fact that we have communication technology that allows one person to, some would argue, not incite a riot or start, you know, we had David Icke in the UK who was talking about how COVID is caused by 5G and then the next day people are burning down <laughs> telephone masks, towers, right? 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 Yeah. Mm. So that I think is, is probably what, where the good intentions of the people that you're talking about were. But at the same time, like once you start censoring Nobel Prize winning scientists who are talking about their field of expertise, that's you know, way too far, exactly. right? So the, the, my point is it, the, the line is somewhere in between and nobody knows exactly where it should be, do they? That's my view on it. Yeah. Um, the only thing that I do know for certain is the line was drawn far, far too close Agreed. towards censorship. And I think while it shouldn't be no line at all that we're agreeing on, and you know, it's something is clearly inciting violence of something, you know, in, in these types of circumstances, but by and large, we need to let ideas be free. We need to let people communicate. And um, again, when you have credentialed people, but we shouldn't only say credentialed experts. There's plenty of people who didn't have credentials who are also correct mm -hmm. on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So that's, it becomes, more, this becomes more and more complicated. So, um, you know, part of being able to live in a society where there is free speech is it's the freedom to be wrong. Um, and that's important too. So there, it's, it is complicated. Um, and I think some people probably have a highly binary, simplistic view, let everything go through. But I think that's fairly 
unrealistic and also unappealing to most people. Again, you know, so for me, um, I, I view my role in this doing what I did, which was I know a lot about this topic. I have access to internal files at Twitter. Let me actually bring this to light for people so they can see what actually happened, these different mechanisms I was explaining by how these things were done. There's a lot more granular details, but that in a nutshell. And then that starts a conversation. That's the start. Yeah. So I, I, it, it would be, I feel like I would be an asshole to be you know, pronoun making pronouncements about, well, here's how everything should run mm -hmm. now. You know, so I don't even feel comfortable saying that. You can tell, you know, we're all sort of saying, we know what happened was wrong. We know the line should be somewhere else, or maybe maybe that's not even the right metaphor. Maybe it's not a line, but it's like a zigzag. Who knows what? It's a levy over the, the day. We can come up with different metaphors, but we don't know exactly. But for my role was, let me just report on this and let's start a conversation. Yeah. And the idea that, that this is, quote, like a nothing burger, as all these people were saying, <laughs> yeah. is so idiotic to me and so like phony, like bogus, naive, like it, everything about that was wrong. I mean, I, I, I know the, the last time I looked, like my thread that I did on Twitter for, the, for my Twitter files that I did, um, I mean, it had more than 60 million views. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm aware, no one covered it in any sort of like legacy media. That outlet. was shocking to me. And so my view on this is, even if, and they would be wrong to say this, but even if someone said, well, what was reported on here isn't important, even if they thought that, the mere fact that something had 60 million views on it, hundreds of thousands of likes or whatever the, the, you know, whatever the statistics were, that in and of itself makes it newsworthy. I mean, that is the definition of news when something is of great interest to an enormous number of people, particularly on a topic like this, that is news in and of itself, even if they felt like the content wasn't important. So that is something that as a society or that people in media, I think need to reckon with. It is just a remarkable comment on, on, on like the environment we're in today, the culture, that something, a thread, you know, and this isn't about me. I mean, Matt Taibbi is reporting that, that their stuff is far more I'll um, give you an in depth than mine, hasn't been covered. How is it possible that, that this stuff was basically ignored. That is remarkable. I'll give you an example. We had it in the UK and I mentioned it at the time. The BBC on the day that the first several instances of the Twitter files were released, mm -hmm. they had a story about uh, Elon Musk firing cleaners who happened to be two women of color. Uh, <laughs> and they had a story uh, which was, it wasn't a story, it was like a piece which is who is the billionaire who's, who's running Twitter, Elon Musk. So they obviously felt that Twitter and Elon Musk were important and significant, right. but they didn't cover the Twitter files at all. And that, to me, that was very telling. Um, but the other thing I wanted to ask you about, and this is obviously something that a lot of people felt on, along political lines prior to the pandemic. And then during the pandemic, it, I think, strengthened the, 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 how people felt in this way about it, which was, you know, Twitter is a company headquartered in California. We all know that California, the values of people in California are not necessarily representative of the entire country or indeed the West more broadly, which is where this conversation was playing itself out. Did you find, did, as you were reading this, did you feel that this was a group of people who were almost captured by a particular worldview or, or just forget captured, that's a loaded term, who held a particular worldview? And as a result of that, they were making decisions that were not necessarily reflective of the worldview shared across the country. A hundred percent. There were exceptions. And like I said, I saw a lot of robust exchanges within Twitter amongst employees. But by and large, absolutely. I mean, again, the fact that they went with, well, here's what the CDC says. That's the truth. I mean, that's crazy that you can't function in a society where a government agency is the truth and, and everything else is considered misleading or disinformation. Um, and all these people, not all, most of them, and, and this is a known thing, are left-leaning, um, for lack of a better term. And because the pandemic in America um, was so politicized, 
Um, you were on one team or another. I found myself, you know, sort of floating in space. I, I had no incentive whatsoever to align myself with Republicans necessarily. Um, for years, I had been a Democrat um, loosely. I mean, I have a complex, as, as you guys probably do too, a complex range of opinions on a complex range of of topics. So I, I don't align you myself. You think for yourself, shocking. I try, you know. And, <laughs> Which and, makes you far right. Yeah, far and, right. But, right. Exactly, <laughs> that means I am a, a right wing. I mean, I, I, did an, I, I did an interview with, um, I forget who it was, with someone who's like center right. Uh -huh. And I sent it to, a. this was, I don't know, a year ago. And I texted with, I'm like a group chat with, with like a bunch of old friends of mine. We've known each other for 20 or more years. And one of them wrote back to me and said, are you in the Proud Boys now? You know, that like white, white supremacist yeah, yeah, group. And yeah. I was like, come on, man. You know, and it, he was like half joking. <laughs> um, Jew and the Proud Boys. But anyway, it was, um, point being, it's like, if you questioned any of these things, you automatically were thrown into that camp on the other team. Mm. And, you know, so for me, as, as I, I think I'm considered one of the only journalists or maybe the, the most prominent one who was writing for a lot of legacy media publications that tend to be left-leaning. Um, but I was writing from a very much um, sort of contrarian viewpoint. Not purposefully, I wasn't like, I'm gonna be the contrarian. It was, that's where the facts took me. And that's what launched me on this early on in the spring of 2020 when this all began. That I saw everything that was happening I, like most of my neighbors and everyone around me, oh my God, there's this crazy virus. Let's, let's like, you know, lock the door, everyone. Mm -hmm. um, but very quickly, because of my professional background as someone I like reading scientific um, journals, I read academic journals, I talk to scholars and research people all the time. So I have that sort of professional background in doing that. And also for better and for worse, my, my temperament, I, I'm always poking holes in things. Mm -hmm. I always see kind of, I'm always skeptical about things. And I very quickly started, well, let me just look and see what the actual evidence is for this. And very quickly, it, it, it took me in a direction that was different from the direction that I was supposed to be in. And all of a sudden I found myself like, you know, cast out of, 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 the, of the boat, cast out of the, of, the, of the thing with everyone else that I was quote, supposed to be with even though there was no, I had zero political incentive for this. I'm not, so, but nevertheless, I was branded that way. You know, I'm, I'm a right winger. What, what are you fucking talking about? You know, I, I was a Bernie supporter years ago. So oh, the, the, this, this incredibly infantile um, binary approach to life is just so uh, tiresome and problematic. But what I've come to believe is that I think that's just how, and this is perhaps a banal observation, but that's just how society operates. Most people want to be in a certain tribe mm -hmm. and their default is like in-group, out-group. And so I spend a lot of time writing about this and digging into this in my book that I'm working on about this. I just, it's, it's incredibly fascinating to me. I, you know, from what I know about both of you guys, I think we're in the same, we are in our own little, it's like the Venn diagram. We're in like this tiny, di I don't know, how, how large is our group? I don't know. Not that we all share the same opinion, but our group of people who are sort of like not, I think there's something, do you think there's something in your personalities? Because I think, I wonder this about myself. Is there something about us and people like us that we seem to have less allegiance to groups than it seems other people do. Do you think there's something, like well, why, for me, how did we end up where we ended for up? For me, it's quite easy because growing up in the Soviet Union, I kind of had a very early experience of like, just because everyone says, everyone goes along with something doesn't mean right. it's true. And that then was that, very like informative. Yeah, and, and then it was replicated more generally. I mean, if, you, if you're a, an intelligent kid, you look around at the adults and you realize these people don't have, don't have a fucking clue what's going on, right? right? So that, from a young age, I realized I'm gonna have to think about things for myself, yeah. you know. But I actually, you know, I think it can be very dispiriting uh, because online communication makes it feel like we are one of a handful and then there's the crazy people on the right and the crazy people on the left. But I think what we forget, and look, the success of our show is kind of reinforcement of this, is there's a hell of a lot of people in the middle who are never gonna leave a YouTube comment. 
who no. don't have a Twitter account, who just want to hear something because they are in the middle, they're trying to make up their mind, they're, 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 they, they're not hard line, and because of that, you don't see them, they don't show up, right? And yeah. there are crucial points in, in the sort of trajectory of society when yes, you have to go in, in the voting booth and you have to pick red or blue. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, I think most people aren't really that welded to those political ideologies. And you don't see them as much because they're not on Twitter screaming because they're trying to get their kid to school and put food on the table and whatever. So at least our hope, certainly mine anyway, is we've always tried to speak to those people and stay away from the crazies on both sides who are, you're right, at this point shaping the debate. No uh, question about it. You, I think you put this far better than I did. I think you're right. I, exactly. I, I, I think I, Smash that. <laughs> <laughs> I should be the guest. S I'm the talent Smash here. that like button. Really. I, <laughs> oh, subscribe. Right. Good point. I, you're right, because I observe so many times. But I guess what worries me about that a little bit is, and again, maybe this is just human nature or society, most people are either disinterested or disinclined to speak up. Mm -hmm. So I think you're both correct that there is a larger number of people like us than yep. there are, the, but because most people, for whatever combination of reasons, don't say, and I've witnessed this myself in my, in my small town that, that I live in with my kids, when the schools were closed, there was this kind of very loud group of people on the local parents' Facebook group, you know, and I'm, I was called a murderer for saying that I thought schools should open, even though kids were in school in Europe at this point. This, uh, you know, why do you want to murder children? I'll never forget that. Someone wow. responded to me that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, you're aware there are millions of children in school elsewhere and they're all, they're fine. I think there, are there still kids in Europe? They're still there, yep. right? Yeah. Okay. Just click, good to confirm that. <laughs> so that's the thing that, there's sort of this dual dynamic. There's both a lot of us, perhaps, but for, for whatever reason, and maybe and a lot of those reasons are good. Those, sometimes it makes sense why someone can't speak out for any number, maybe their job, they're afraid. It's, it's regrettable. Um, I wish more people were a little more vocal or involved then if they didn't, it, because the forces particularly, and I guess I have, Believe me, I have no shortage of, of condemnation for people on the far right, mm. but I'm far more sensitive about the left for two reasons. One is that I think I, I used to associate myself with the left for most of my adult life, so I have, have like a greater sense of betrayal, I feel, um, in the way I feel like so many of these people behave during the pandemic. So that's number one. Number two, by and large, the left controls the major levers of society. Yes, the, the, the politicians in Washington or in different state houses or whatever change you know, at each election cycle, and, but technology, um, the movie industry, media, publishing, fashion, so many major pillars of our society, the cultural sort of cornerstones are far dominated by the left. So that's why I have like a particular sensitivity of when the left by and large moves in a certain direction, why that really needs to be kept in check so much. Let's dive into the media a second because we're talking about journalism here. And if you think about movies, there was always the archetype of the intrepid journalist going where others feared to tread in order to get the story. For example, if you look at superheroes, I don't think it's an accident that Peter Parker, Spider-Man, is a photojournalist and Superman is a journalist. Right. You know, they were the ones challenging authority. When did that stop? When did <laughs> we, st we start seeing a journalist as someone to basically uphold what the government's saying? One of the things that like blew my mind <laughs> in the beginning of the pandemic and as what went on was that um, I kept thinking, and I've written a number of pieces that I, I believe it's fair to say that I kind of blew something open in the sort of legacy media that, that wasn't being talked about. Whether I was wrote very early on, the very beginning of May, saying we should be opening schools, here's why, here's a long compendium of data to show why this is a good idea. Um, I, there's this, in, 
I don't think this was common in, 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 in Britain or elsewhere, but we had this hybrid schooling model here where kids go to school for one or two days a week and they stayed home and they had to, and, and, I, and, That's and, fucking crazy. and I was the first person to write a big piece on this and I had a number of experts in, in the article saying right. like, this is completely idiotic on, for multiple reasons. There's no evidence that this is going to reduce transmission. So I wrote that. There's a piece that I wrote questioning the CDC had guidance. I'm, I'm gonna get to my point in one second. The CDC had um, guidance before um, the uh, summer camp guidance where they wanted children to wear masks outdoors. And when I saw that the guidance came out, I'm like, this is nuts. So I immediately, I reached out to some really prominent people in the field, uh, Dimitri um, Christakis is the, the editor-in-chief of JAMA Pediatrics, uh, you know, the foremost pediatric medical journal, an immunologist at Columbia University Hospital, these people, and I reached out to them, they said, am I crazy or is this like completely insane? And, and they were like, oh, this is, this is horrible. And, it, and, but, and, the, and I had a handful of other pieces on myocarditis. I interviewed the guy, um, the Israeli scientist who wrote, basically released the first major report um, I don't even know how I got a hold of him, but I'm there. I am texting with this guy on WhatsApp, and we're, you know, put, so there were a bunch of instances where I wrote about things that I hadn't seen exposed yet. Also, the hospitalizations. Sorry, now I'm just take your time. Take I'm your just time. Too, this is what we do. So okay, so don't so, rush. Take your time. But, but, I, I mentioned this not as an aggrandizement, but to a larger point that I'm about David to make. David is brilliant. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean he's so fucking yes. good. So, yeah. so not, but there, the hot, people have been murmuring for quite a while that you know, maybe this hospitalization numbers aren't actually reflective of people who are in the hospital. It, rather, it's with COVID rather than from COVID. Now, this also uh, ties into our conversation about the suppression and censorship on Twitter and elsewhere. For a long time, that was considered a conspiracy theory and you're crazy. Well, it turns out that's true. And, and, and I reported on um, these two studies that were done on pediatric admissions. And at the time, at least 40% of the pediatric COVID admissions were unrelated to COVID. A kid, maybe they broke their foot or something and they had to test them for COVID and they just incidentally had COVID, but it had nothing to do with why they were in the hospital. But nevertheless, that was added to the tally. Just very quickly, I had a, I had okay. a joke that I tweeted during the pandemic. I said, my, my uh, grandfather died with his wife by his side. Uh, but it was the middle of the pandemic, so they decided he died of her, not, uh, and, and put her in prison anyway. Exactly, it, it was absurd. So, but if you, but people said this were conspiracy theorists. Yeah, yeah. you're some asshole. But it was true. So, anyway, so the reason I mention all of these things: the, the school closures, the hybrid shit, the, 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 the myocarditis, the, the, and then a handful of other things. Over and over, I kept thinking, I, I need to like get this thing out. I got part of being a journalist. I generally like a slow moving on less in the news cycle, but because I found myself in this, you wanna be first. I'm like, this is exciting. And each time I'd be in a panic because you know, I, I turn an article at first, I pitch an article to, to an editor, then if they accept it, then there's, you know, then I'm writing it, I'm researching it, you know, the, the editors go back. It, it could take a week or two weeks or longer before you finally put the thing out, depending how in depth it is. And I, every, I'd just be nervous waiting that someone else is gonna scoop me. And no one did any of those times. And slowly I started seeing this pattern. And that's the thing, this is a very long response to your, to your prompt about where's the intrepid reporter? And I'm not saying I am the embodiment of that, but what I would say is there was an absence of that elsewhere. When I wrote that thing about the um, summer camp guidance, I think a day or two before my piece came out, there was a thing in the New York Times on it, and it was like, the nukes, you know, CDC guidance for camps is out, here's how to keep your kids safe. And it just unquestioningly, they had one or two, you know, doctors who talked about it. No one questioned the, the, um, the validity of any of these recommendations, including making a kid wear a mask while they're gonna be playing tennis with someone, you know, uh, 30 feet away on the other side of a net. No, it wasn't questioned. So it's this idea of like, a journal, is a journalist just like a megaphone? You know, maybe in some instances, instances that's appropriate, but by and large, that's what these people were doing. And I was kind of astonished that over and over, it seemed like these large media operations with millions or hundreds of millions of dollars behind them, these are huge institutions with large staffs of people and editors and you know, this whole operation. And they weren't questioning the guidance. They weren't questioning what was said. They were simply reporting it. And they had the same crew 
of experts oftentimes, and I use experts in quotes because oftentimes this is someone like, there was a particular emergency room physician who, for, uh, who I think was at Brown at the time, um, who was quoted constantly in the New York Times and CNN and these other places. This person had no expertise on infectious diseases, had no expertise on, on mitigation measures and their effectiveness. Nevertheless, this person was quoted, they're on like the speed dial um, at a place like the New York Times. Um, so you had no questions asked of, of Fauci or CDC. And then when there was sort of questions asked, it was almost always from the same pool of, of, of quote experts who were basically just supporting what was being said anyway. So that's, that was the weird thing for me. I just was, now when I look back, it's funny, but you can imagine me, I was so nervous I was gonna get scooped on each of these things. Someone surely is going to write a piece in some major place about like, why our schools aren't open here when they're open everywhere else. And I'm like, no one wrote that. Someone surely is going to write about the hospitalizations. Someone, all these things, and it wasn't happening. So it, it's just been, it was just a bizarre experience that I will never get over. Like it's permanently altered me. Um, it, seeing this, you know, from my own experience as a writer um, in that environment. And it also has repercussions right the way down the line because we've all agreed that the media weren't being honest about COVID. The mainstream media weren't being honest. I think that's, that's fair to say. And then they report on Ukraine and everybody goes, well, how can I trust you? And then you get a large portion of people coming out and going, well, they weren't honest about COVID, AKA they're not gonna be honest about this. I don't believe it. And then what you have is a fundamental breakdown between media and the people. And that's a really dangerous place to be in. I mean, I think there's a couple things there. Journalism, in my view, should be adversarial to authority mm. and, and for whatever complex range of reasons um, that you know we could go into, but it's uh, again writing a thousand pages on on the on the why, but for a long range of reasons, that sort of skepticism of of institutions um, was absent. It, it vaporized. We love I big pharma now, right? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, these are the. These are the things that traditionally doesn't make people any on the, sense. People it doesn't the left, fentanyl. They used to you know, the left traditionally was like speak for yourself. Highly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> was like highly skeptical of these places like big pharma, the government, you know, these right. but because I think because it's so politicized, yes. they then just threw their hat in with this group. Uh, that's one piece of it. I don't think it's the only piece. Um, that that and then the public ends up not trusting it because they or at least a, a, a large seg yeah. segment of the public. And I think one of the things that's funny, not to get too far afield here, but, and if, if I'm not already canceled, maybe this will cancel me, but e like, excellent. But here we go, um, is that there's so much talk about diversity, which is important, you know, for racial diversity and other types, but we don't see, and again, this is an observation many people think, there's not an ideological diversity in a lot of these institutions. And like, most of the people who work at, these, you know, at the, at the Times or, or at, you know, these major TV networks. These are, I mean, I know a lot of these people personally, and I know of. The, they all went to Yale and Brown and Columbia and Harvard. They all went to the same places. They're all there inside there. Imagine if the Times, instead of their diversity lens, instead if it was trained on, well, let's let's hire some people who just went to some community college. Let's go and let's get someone who grew up in, in West Virginia and maybe didn't go to college at all, but is like real smart and has some sort of grit. Imagine how different the coverage would be uh, of all sorts of issues, whether it's related to the pandemic or otherwise. So although there's certain types of diversity, but you're missing out on, on working class people, you know, journalism used to be more of a working class kind of profession mm -hmm. at one point in certain regards, you know, you know, a number of generations ago. Now it's, a, it's far more, um, I think, elitist. So these people, and, and I think that there's a wonderful article, I think it's Thomas Frank from years ago in Harper's, um, and he wrote about how um, Bernie Sanders, and he was running, basically was murdered by the, his, his campaign um, by, the mainstream media, and and he roughly says this, and this is some of my own sort of projection onto his thesis, but in order to get into a place like Yale or Brown, how do you get in there? Well, 
you're a certain type of person who follows rules. Maybe some people get in there who are iconoclasts, they're just brilliant, but most of the people, you're getting in there because you're an apple polisher, you're the worker bee, you know how to get straight A's, you know, 4.0 grade average, you're a perfect student, and then you get in there and you're, you know how to work your way within an institution and network and you get perfect grades there, and then maybe you go to Columbia Journalism School and you follow this path. So there, the way that these people became successful was through a certain path. That's their life, that's their lived experience, mm-hmm. is, is doing this. So it makes sense. So then they saw Bernie as this outsider. How could this guy win? Or who dare he? You know, how should he do this? You know, he's not one of us. Mm-hmm. And I think, and I think we also see that in coverage of a whole range of issues, including with the pandemic, that if you have all these people who all know each other, they all have the same kind of background, the same way that they became successful, um, that to, to veer from that, I'm not even saying this is a conscious thing. I think it's just like, it makes sense. This is just how they view things. So that, that, that's, my, that's my thesis on, on that. <laughs> and we haven't even reached, as far as I'm concerned, the real punchline of the pandemic, which is the effect on children's education and attainment. And also as well, what that is going to be doing to the ever widening gap between attainment between rich kids and poor kids. Right, well, you know, there's, um, my focus on reporting has not been on what what people will call sort of like victim porn on the horrible things that happen to children. Uh, um, Because to me, it's just like so self-evident that this was absurd. but there's so much just obvious evidence from this. This was obvious before it even happened. Mm-hmm. And now we have also from the academic harms, um, you know, from kids. And we know that children who are in less privileged backgrounds were going to do, we knew this was going to happen. I wrote a piece for the New York Times actually early on in the pandemic about what they call these pod schools. Mm-hmm. They probably didn't have this in the UK where um, you would pay, wealthy parents would pay, generally wealthy, you know, it could be $20,000 where a group of parents got together and they hired a teacher and they had a pod of like, it could be five kids, 10 kids, where they, because the schools were closed. Um, so those kids who had the money, they had the pod or they had tutors, they have, you know, they can get all this extra help. But some kid who's living in, you know, a tiny apartment in the Bronx um, with, with eight other people or whatever the circumstance may be. And there are those kids um, because I've spoken to them and I've spoken to their parents and their teachers. They they were never going to learn jack shit. Um, They didn't have an internet connection. There were kids who were sitting in a parking lot of the Taco Bell so they could have a Wi-Fi connection to try to get on to some bullshit remote learning program. That is nuts. So for any, so, the idea, because I was branded a racist, as were many other people who advocated for schools to open, they was considered, they said it's racist to want schools to open, it's white supremacist. But the, the, the horrible irony, of course, is that the greatest harms were, go- we knew this from, this could be seen very easily from the beginning, and it was obvious while it was happening, the greatest harms were born by the kids who were Brian, uh, disproportionately black, or brown, um, and certainly moving away from race just who had less resources, regardless of what your race was. We knew the people who have the money, they're always gonna be okay, most of them. I mean, those kids suffer too, make no mistake, a lot of them, everyone's different. And it's not automatically you're gonna do horribly if you don't have money, but that's the broad trend. And this was of course obvious, so school is more than just a place for learning math or something, and particularly for younger kids. In America, school has a role of, of a, a societal function where there are, people, by the way, were dismissed and maligned for saying, oh, you, you just want a babysitter. Oh, it's a bunch of parents just want babysitters for their kids. Well, that's, that should not be put down. Like care for children is really important. Mm-hmm. And that's a wonderful function of school. That's not something that should have been like dismissed as like you're an asshole for wanting your, you know, six-year-old to go to a place while you're going to work. Like, but somehow these people were branded as selfish for It's the sort of thing you say insane. when you've got your own babysitter that you can pay for. <laughs> right. that, that's, exactly. that's when you can Very say good point. it, right? Exactly. And, and that's where it comes from. But I know you've got a book about this coming out. So uh, we'll tell everybody when it's coming out and what it's gonna be called. <laughs> well, it's called An Abundance of Caution. Uh-huh. Um, 
at least in the States, I feel like they did in the UK too, this phrase was constantly used, out of an abundance of caution, dot, dot, dot. And I remember when they closed my kids' schools, mm -hmm. that the email was sent out, and there it was, out of an abundance of caution, we need to close schools for a deep cleaning. And they said, you know, which meant nothing. But um, so that phrase always stuck in my head because the question is, well, caution in what direction? Um, and what, That's right. And, and, That's and, right. and what we, what I spend a lot of time writing about, and God knows when the book's going to come out, because I'm still working on it now, so probably not for a year. <laughs> I saw so. that when I asked David, there was that little pang. I know yes, that I've the, written the, the book. Pain, the, the, it's the like, pain. <sighs> Every night, like my son, he's like, Dad, are you still working on that book? I'm like, yes, stop <laughs> asking me. <laughs> I'd like, my like, temple is pulsing. Yeah. You know, thinking about, but, um, but you think about a lot of these interventions, including school closures, I think there's good evidence that the most important word that is not talked about enough about relation to the pandemic and these interventions is time. And a lot of things can be effective over a very short period of time. If a physician puts on a very tightly fitted N95 respirator and sees a patient for a 10 minute checkup in a room, that mask may very well be protective to some extent. Um, but that's different from wearing some bullshit cloth mask in a classroom with 20 other kids for eight hours. And similarly, you know, pulling the master switch and keeping everyone home for a week or two weeks, or not everyone, but the people who can stay home, that can definitely have an effect. I think there's good evidence. The problem is a pandemic's a marathon. It's not gonna end and, you know, quickly. And over time, we know that people's ability to comply with things wanes. Mm. You just, wearing a mask is fucking annoying mm. for most people. <laughs> um, it's not natural. And whether you purposely don't want to do it or you're just like, even subconsciously, you're tugging at it, people are rubbing their eyes. They've done studies on this. You can see people constantly touching their face or whether it's something like school closures, people are going to spread their ability. And there's Google mobility data for this too. You could see people just started moving around more and more as time went on. We're, and you saw this happen even in places where the restrictions were still in place, mm -hmm. that that didn't stop it. That you can't like hammer people with this stuff. Human beings, most of them are not comfortable being completely isolated from each other. They can't do it. And so what happens is this, this confusion about, well, this works or that doesn't work. Of course, if people don't go to school, there'll be less transmission. Well, yeah, maybe for a week or two, but over a month or two months or three months, and that's the main misconception, I think, that a lot of people have about these interventions. That yes, I'm not someone who says, masks don't work, or this quote doesn't work. That's, that's too simplistic of a way of framing these things. It's some things may work to some extent, in this particular circumstance for a certain period of time. It's not a sexy answer. It's not as easy to just tweet that, but that's the truth. that You need all these little qualifiers. So we knew that over time, this stuff was simply not gonna be effective. And, and that's what I believe the evidence shows. Well, I was gonna wrap up that, but yeah. just uh, maybe one more thing on that. I think one of the things that you touched on there, but I think we could expand on a little bit is that too many people forget that safety isn't the only thing that we are ever pursuing. I mean, freedom for this country would not exist if people didn't get together who valued something other than safety above safety, right? The, the United States was created by a bunch of people who put themselves in harm's way. That is the very definition of being the opposite of safety for something else. Right. That something else is called freedom in their case, right? So the, the, one of the reasons I think we're stuck in the place that we're stuck in is that people have forgotten that safety is not the only value. It's, it's not the only thing that we care about and we cannot care about, otherwise we'd never leave the house. And I would say two things. One, agree with you 100% on that, that you know, there's a reason why we, right, people go swimming, even though a certain number of people drown every year swimming, we get in a car, we do, Everything, if you, the second you step out of your house, there's some degree of danger depending on what you're gonna do, but that's part of life, including we also endanger other people because the argument against what you're saying, people say, well, that's different. That's you just endangering yourself. But with the virus, you're endangering other people. Well, guess what? Every time you get in a car, you're endangering other people too. But we all choose to partake in that and we don't 
force everyone to drive 10 miles an hour. That's we right. allow for, so there's a whole range of things we do where we are endangering each other and we accept that as a society because we value these other things for human flourishing beyond just putting ourselves in bubble wrap. But the other thing is, Staying home is not safe either over time. And that's the other flip side, again, about this idea of caution, that it's like, well, there are people, and I, I wrote this piece about this church that um, got in a huge lawsuit with a, a county in California um, where they were barred, all churches there were barred from having anyone gather indoors for many, many, many months. And, and so the, they, this church ignored the guidelines. People got together anyway, and they accrued an extraordinary number of fines. And it's an it's an amazing story. I mean, they were spied on. They they had they were the, the, they were special health officers peering at them through a chain link fence. They were right at, they were going into the church and monitoring private activities. It was it's an insane story. But but the the message from it though, is, to your point, is a lot of the people I interviewed. These were people from, from the church, church members. These were people, and by the way, I don't attend church. I had no skin in the game about sport. But these are people suffering from addiction, um, elderly people who were profoundly lonely. Mm -hmm. There was a guy who, I think there were more than one. I spoke to one myself who wanted to commit suicide because he was so profoundly lonely. He had gone through a breakup. And for these people, church was their support system. Mm -hmm. Is it mine? No. But I have to understand and respect for them, they needed this. So the idea that they're safe because they're kept home was bullshit. These people, some of them were literally at risk of dying themselves. And we know that there's epigenetics with when you, how your environment affects your immune system. It is telling a bunch of people you need to be isolated, particularly elderly people. Oh, you're in an old age home and your family can't visit you. Like, of course, that has a profound effect on people's underlying health. So we're seeing this and it's very complicated, but with excess death rates and all sorts of other measures about what makes for a good life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to your point, this sort of like myopic focus on a virus and not looking at all these other aspects of what makes for a flourishing life. Um, again, maybe that made sense for a couple weeks in the beginning, but very quickly that, you know, the ratio changes about what is reasonable. Um, both from a public health standpoint and also a, a mental health standpoint. Um, so David, that's how I view it. <laughs> it's been a fantastic interview. That Thank you so, so much for coming on the show. The final question we always ask all our guests is, um, are you vaccinated? No, I'm Because <laughs> 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 oh, if you're not, you're killing people. No, um, you're a murderer. <laughs> you're a murderer and um, you're murdering kids. Anyway, uh, it's uh, what's the one thing we're not talking about as a society that we really should be? I, I would say, just moving away from this topic, mm. one thing that has long interested me is... Um, Everyone talks about climate change um, as this macro concern. And I'm not, I'm not even gonna touch on the validity of the, this. But one thing that I think is really important for people who care about the environment, and, and I'm someone who's long cared about the environment very much, is climate change is a very abstract idea. But there are very concrete things that are happening to our planet and to animals that we actually can stop. Because it seems like we fail at climate change. Every year they have the meetings, they go to you know, Davos or the, you know, Kyoto or wherever else and they talk about it. But like, we still keep producing, like this isn't working. But one You have stolen we, my dreams. <laughs> right, exactly. But the thing we can do is, you know, there are an enormous number of sharks that are killed every year so people can have soup with their fin. Are you fucking kidding me? And they, slice the fin off this majestic animal and they just toss them back in the ocean and they're left there to just slowly bleed out and die. Um, and they don't even use the rest of the animal. So shark fin soup, or you think about, um, there are still multiple countries that do commercial whaling. I think, I might be wrong, but I think it's like Iceland, Norway, um, Japan. That is insane uh, to, my, to my view. Um, and, you, and palm oil. I'll stop here, but you know, most of the garbage that we eat, you know, all these processed foods, they have palm oil in them. That is a massive um, source of deforestation. They burn or chop down incredibly important and rich um, 
rainforests or in other really old growth forests and put up a bunch of you know, palm trees for making palm oil. That is horrible for the species that used to live there who are now dead because they don't have a home, horrible for greenhouse. So those are the things that I think get lost. Once, it's, you know, once again, it's easy to just be like, we need to help and stop climate change. Well, guess what? That messaging failed. It doesn't seem to work because we still keep producing all this stuff. So instead, I would love for people to focus more on how do we save specific animals? How do we stop specific practices that to my mind are completely unacceptable and in 50 years from now, we will be embarrassed that these things were happening from factory farms to the shark fins, et cetera. That's what people should talk about. Absolutely, David. Thank <laughs> you so much for coming on the show. Uh, really looking forward uh, to reading your upcoming book. Of course, you have got this one as well, yes. which we, we didn't get to talk Buy about. Buy this book, everybody. Please. Buy this book, uh, everybody. <laughs> and we're going to head over to Locals for your bonus questions. So join us there. Uh, all the links for David's work are in the description. Uh, take care and we'll see you on Locals very shortly.